I'm Stan Lee. I've been writing stories for the young generation for the past 30 years, and in the course of that time, well, I would imagine I receive about two to three hundred fan letters every day, probably as much as the Beatles. I spend most of my time reading the mail and quite a lot of time answering it. During this time, I think I've learned a lot about what young people think. More importantly, I think I've learned a lot about what young people are. Today, we've come to a time in history when there definitely is a generation gap. It seems to us that perhaps anything that can be done to bridge this gap, anything that can be done to help present the point of view of these young people without being patronizing, without hostility, with respect, with attention, would be a very beneficial thing. We think that a voice is needed. Oh sure, they talk a lot, and they yell a lot, and they demand a lot, but so often nobody really listens to them. We're going to try to present a voice that somebody will listen to. The voice is needed. We hope it will be ours. Today's show will cover subjects that we feel are uppermost in the minds of young people and, in fact, most of the people in the nation. Things such as Vietnam, rebellion, what the young generation really wants, the hippie rebellion, of course, and uh, that old war horse sex. Our guests today are hip and they're interesting. And we hope you'll find the show the same. Thank you. My name is Skip Weiss. I'm Adult Schools editor of Adult Honor. I'm Stan Lee, editor and chief writer of Marvel Comics. I'm Chuck Scoro, a senior at Columbia College and managing editor of the Columbia Daily Spectator. I'm Jeff Shero. I edit Rat Newspaper, the voice of the underground in New York City. Now, it would seem that we're an, odd, an oddly assorted group, I would imagine. I think it would be fun to find out if we're as different as we seem to be, or perhaps as similar as we may seem to be. Um, we may be more similar. I didn't realize that uh, Jeff would have a beard. At any rate, Jeff, I was wondering, would you say that you're more of a journalist or more of a provocateur? Well, I'm both, because uh, we don't believe that uh, there's anything like detached journalism. There's only uh, participatory journalism. The New York Times and the Rat are both expressing biases. The New York Times is the elite's version of our American history. The Rat is uh, another version of our history, but it's the uh, version of the insurgency. Of course, the New York Times might not agree. They might not phrase it the way you did. How do you feel about it, Skip? Do you feel that um, everything that's written is biased, or uh, do you yes. trust? You do really. <laughs> well, now, on a newspaper like yours, the Daltonian, are you free to express your bias? Do you uh, write what you want to write? Well, to a, uh, we have a certain extent. I mean, if we're going to poison pen somebody, we don't do it. But as far as uh, censorship, we have very little. We can write what we want, what we feel about the administration, what we feel about the school, as long as it doesn't go overboard. <laughs> what we find out about administration. After a while, find out about a school, things like that. But uh, no, we have a uh, big press. And of course, there's been a little excitement at Columbia lately. What's the story uh, with the Columbia Spectator, uh, Chuck? Do you um, presently have all the freedom that you would like to have on that newspaper? We have. A all the freedom that we could possibly have. In 1961, we became totally independent of the university. As far as I know, we've never had anything like a, a faculty advisor or anything like that. We have to you know, stay within the laws of libel, and I suppose within obscenity laws, but those are the only things holding us back. Why didn't, why didn't the spectator do more muckraking of the connections of the Board of Regents during the uh, uprising at Columbia? You mean the trustees? Exactly. Right. I mean, they like into people like Percy Uris, who uh, control a great deal of real estate uh, in this uh, city, who uh, had building contracts from the university, and who sit on the board of trustees. Rat did an important job of exposing a lot of those uh, power structure links in that university, and uh, I don't think the spectator did. Well, I think Rat's not doing a bad job there. You have to remember that the uh, the, edit the editors and spectator change every year. Under the old editorial management board, such things were were sort of anathema. 
uh, during the things last spring, we were working, well, we were working until we dropped. We'd work, you know, whoever dropped after 40 hours, we'd drop and sleep a few hours, like that. Jeff, do you find that uh, in a newspaper like RAT, even if you come up with something meaningful, the fact that it's published in a newspaper of your type gives it less impact than if, for example, it appeared in the Columbia Spectator or in the New York Times? Obviously less than the New York Times, but more than the Columbia Spectator. A good indication is the uh, papers like the RAT and SDS have made an issue of uh, the present uh, uh, head of Columbia Cordier's uh, relationship to uh, the death of Lumumba in the Congo. And the New York Times felt compelled to answer the charges today. So I think we have considerable impact. Uh, well, Enough impact that the FBI approached our landlord and tried to get us uh, <laughs> removed from our building. Well, I know that can happen. I was just wondering, though, it would seem that the physical nature of an underground newspaper uh, doesn't really help to give credence to the things that are said. Uh, most people would think, well, it appears in there. They're just a bunch of radicals anyway. And the fact that there is so much obscenity in the newspapers I would imagine would turn off a lot of newspapers. Uh, I've been wondering, is the obscenity necessary? Is there a definite reason for it? Well, I am worried about obscenity in newspapers. I, I always see it, in particularly the daily news in the New York Times, the stuff about Vietnam and nuclear war and starving children in Biafra. The obscenity is horrible. And we try to uh, avoid the obscenities of the society or deal with them in a good way in the red as much as possible. We try to build those forces of change, but uh, uh, the fact is that it's an obscene world that we live in, and so that those obscenities have to enter into the paper. Well, you see, philosophically, I know what you're saying, but I just wonder, if I were editing an underground newspaper or any newspaper, and I had some sort of a message or some sort of a mission, it would seem to me I would want to present it in a way that would give me the widest possible audience. Now, the magazines that I edit, we have all sorts of subliminal messages in these magazines, but we don't do anything in the magazine that will turn any segment of the readership away from us. At least we don't do it intentionally. Well, I think that's an old-fashioned view because it assumes that people have power, and people in America don't have any power. The, the only people that will have any effect on where the country is going, the course of the country, are people that are committed and uh, people who uh, sit at the top and have the reins of power. And it's only young people who are committed to changing this society. And so the rat is attempting to talk to young people. The vast globby uh, people sitting out in the suburbs, well, they're human beings of the sort, but, but they're not important when we're talking about how to remedy the ills of the society. And Chuck, do you know how many, uh, roughly, how many readers the underground newspapers have in this country? Oh boy, I couldn't even estimate. A great many college students and high school students read underground newspapers. Mm -hmm. And do you feel that they have perhaps more influence than the establishment is willing to concede? Well, the establishment is seldom willing to concede anything, so I'm sure that they do. Um, it's hard to say how much effect. Uh, underground newspapers, they do speak to a certain audience, and that certain audience is very receptive to what they're saying. Would you say, Skip, that the fellows at a school like Dalton are part of the audience of an underground newspaper? Yes. We have an extreme right of the uh, movement at Dalton. Matter of fact, um, last year, before I was the editor of Daltonian, uh, we had a lot of problems with censorship. And uh, so a couple of kids got together, and uh, they put out their own newspaper, the left bank. And it was an underground newspaper, and uh, it had quite a bit of followers, supported just by the Dalton students. Because people, you know, when you, whenever you have a newspaper, you know somebody else, big brother, somebody in power, is going to say, that's no good, it cuts up somebody, take it out. You're missing a lot. You know, you know what you're reading may be good, but you're trying to think, what am I missing? What's not here? And you turn to an underground newspaper, and you'll find it, not paper usually. Well, the next question, do you feel the word newspaper really applies to your average underground newspaper? I am on the subscription list of almost all of them. I read them. I must admit I get a kick out of them. But uh, the if you gauge the proportion of news to the other things in the paper, I wonder if they're any more of a newspaper than your average uh, specialized magazine might be. Well, I think they are because uh, we have a motto on the rat. The job of a radical newspaper is to define and make the news. Now, I don't want to get too abstract, but... I think people could understand that best in an area like sports. We have certain established sports in this country, such as baseball, 
and uh, football. And uh, the newspapers carry on and say, that thing that happens in Yankee Stadium uh, is important, and therefore they write it all up every day of the uh, baseball season. However, if you look at our society, far more people are interested in motor cars. Uh, many people are interested in sports like surfing or parachuting, and yet that isn't defined as news, yet those activities go on daily, you see. And so um, the New York Times defines, in a way, what news is. Well, now let's and, get to uh, we have a different definition. We, we're trying to break out of that old uh, tradition, that old consciousness, and uh, have new ideas about what news might be and what affects people in this society. It seems to me that our original premise was to find out how similar or dissimilar we may be. So far in the brief time I've spoken to the three of you, I have a feeling that there's a unanimity of thought amongst you, even though you all represent different publications. Now, what I would like to know and I really pose this to Jeff because I think the underground newspaper is more typical of what we're talking about. And what I would like to know, obviously you're interested in change. And you're interested in doing something to society as it is now. What is it exactly that you want changed? How would you want society to be? Because maybe there's a desire among young people that the establishment isn't even aware of. I have a feeling uh, and I'm not trying to stop you from answering, I just want to mention this. I have a, a feeling that uh, the establishment, as we call it, considers most young people as those who just want change for the sake of change and are carried up by the excitement of having the liberty and freedom to yell and scream and make a general nuisance of themselves. I wonder, is there something deeper? Is there something you're all really seeking? I'm Skip Wise, the Daltonian editor. Stan Lee, editor of Marvel Comics. I'm Chuck Scorrell from the Columbia Daily Spectator. And I'm Jeff Sherrill, editor of an underground newspaper called Rat. Now, I think when we left off, we were trying to find out what it is that the young people of the country today are really trying to change, if there is anything that they're trying to change in particular. Anybody want to grab that? Well, it's, it's obvious that there's uh, basic things basic problems. I mean, look at the war in Vietnam. People are deeply disturbed about the wiping out of the Vietnamese people and the, the senseless sending off of our young uh, troops to, to die over there for political ends, really. The racism of the country is blatant. Uh, the universities are factories to send people out into corporations and the schools uh, uh, constrain people so that they uh, are taught not to be curious and alive, but rather to be disciplined and accept authority. But if we take each separate issue, we really never get down to it, because the malaise is much deeper in America. And it seems to me that there's this whole quality of life question, that in this society with all this wealth, there's no real purpose, that people don't have anything to live for, that the question uh, uh, we're told we should, for instance, live with law and order, and nobody talks really about justice. And uh, people say, well, success is this accumulation of objects, this house and two or three cars and a speedboat and that kind of thing. And never talk about uh, daring, a well, man Jeff, pushing me, himself to a boundary that he didn't dream he could make. Let me play the devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, let's take one of the points you've made. Let's take the law and order one, which we hear so much about these days. Uh, it's a funny thing, but we seem to have embarked upon a semantic expedition here in this country where it reminds me of Orwell's book, uh, 1984, where suddenly words don't mean what they should mean. Yeah, law now, and order means keep down black people. Now, Sometimes isn't it hippies. possible that law and order could mean law and order? People feel there is too much crime in, in the uh, nation today, and they would like law and order. Why does this necessarily have to be a racist remark? I mean, possibly it may be in, in the mouths of some people, but I find I'm almost embarrassed to say, gee, I think we ought to have law and order. I, I find people look at me in a strange way. What, well, how can you say law and order when you see on the TV that Negroes riding in Harlem are reaching into store windows and taking out TV sets and dresses, and cops are standing there watching because they're, they're told not to hit these people because they're going to decide a lot. Should they hit no. them? Of course they should. The stores rob them every day of their lives. You see, it's perfect. Is that, oh, is that, that's a, oh, this is a justification for going Absolutely. 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 We have material objects by the thousands. Let everybody have a, a free TV set. You see, Why not? Skip and Stan, 
When, Would you when, take somebody's life over a TV set or hit him on the head for a TV set? Well, I don't think that Skip was saying somebody yeah. should be killed because of What do you think, Jeff? When you say law and order and you say you want law and order, you're presupposing that people can get the changes they want in this country at this time by by me within, you know, your quotation marks, law and order. But when you can watch the, the Democratic National Convention on television and say Hubert Humphrey nominated, <laughs> and a few weeks earlier, you can see you know, Nixon nominated, you really wonder if people can actually get what they want, get the changes they want made within the structure. Well, let me ask you something about that now. I do not get terribly excited about Richard Nixon or Hubert Horatio Humphrey. Yeah. However, is it right if there's something we don't like, if a candidate is nominated whom we don't care for, is it right for us then to take things into our own hands? Or, Jeff, as far as what you said, if there's a television set in a window that you can't afford, is it right to break the window and take it? Because this, to me, doesn't seem to be a new wave of the future. This seems to be anarchy. This seems to be leading to something where eventually the minority groups are going to be more injured than ever before. Because when law and order break down, the ones who are hurt are the ones that I think you're siding with now. The minority groups and the have-nots become even have nuttier when there is no law in order to protect them. No, I, I really disagree with that. It seems to me that this society is wealthy enough uh, to provide all the material goods Agreed. that one would need. Agreed. And the only thing preventing that is corporations have to make profits. And so... Well, that's uh, a non sequitur. Corporations making profits doesn't... Uh, that, that particular statement doesn't mean that poor people can't be provided with goods. Well, I mean, look at the evidence. Well, are poor people provided with goods in this society? No, they are not. Well, actually, in every society, there have been wealthy people and poor people. Now, I think there's one point you're overlooking. Well, there's degrees to that. Though. Yes, I agree. Take something like... Take fascism, take Nazism. People very often will compare things that happen in the nation today with uh, Hitler's Germany. But I think the very most important point is uh, racial uh, persecution in Hitler's Germany was an official government-sponsored policy. In this country, the government is not in favor of most of the bad things that are happening. I don't think any objective person can say that Lyndon Johnson wants to keep poor people poor or that any president I don't think Nixon wants it. I don't think Humphrey wants it. I don't think Wallace wants there to be a poor class in this country. I don't think that the candidates are the villains that so many of you young people think they are. No, I think wait, radicals don't believe that the individuals are villains. For instance, we're strongly opposed to war in Vietnam, and we've made that distinction, say, about when McNamara was Secretary of Defense. We never said that McNamara himself is an evil man. He's trapped in a system. He runs a system which will dump napalm and burn to death thousands of Vietnamese. Yet if you brought a Vietnamese girl into, uh, to McNamara's office and gave him napalm to throw on her, he wouldn't think about that. So it's it goes system. deeper. It goes deeper system. than people want. Well, you're right. You feel it's the system. Now, um, when you take something like poverty, again, and you mention corporations, and I come back to that because I've heard that so often, and I've read it in newspapers such as yours, and I know it's a point that many young people uh, feel deeply about today, doesn't it stand to reason that your American corporations wish, wish that everybody were wealthy because then they would have more consumers to buy their products? I don't think there are poor people because of the corporations. There obviously is a malaise in this country, as you say. We all wish we could have utopia and there would be no poor people. We're trying to work toward that end. I just don't think the solution is to throw bricks in windows or to say, if the law doesn't satisfy us and if it doesn't make everything perfect, then let's abandon the law or let's make up our own laws. Because I suspect well, I things will be worse. we make up our own laws. Isn't that what's no, I mean change them arbitrarily system. without democratic process. But there is, where is the democratic process in America? Well, we have provisions for that. Do you think those provisions work? Well, they're the best set of laws of rules for changing laws that have been devised. Yet, yeah, I don't think throwing a brick is a better system of creating laws. Uh, but I haven't advocated the policy of throwing bricks. What I advocate is that people organize so that they can gather together and have power. 
and redistribute power in this country because I think that power is managed by a very few individuals. Well, now you don't sound so radical. How do you fellas feel? That's a very radical thing because it involves, at times, throwing bricks. You see, Stan, change in this country, at least in the last few years, has not come about without something like this. You don't, you know, you don't say to white people, you know, here is this whole class of black people who don't have the power they should have, don't have the rights they should have. And you don't say, all right, white people, you know about the problem, do something about it. It doesn't work that way. It, it works in a way that black people organize, that, that in reality, though I hate to say it, white people are beginning to fear black people. And without really being forced into it, I can't imagine uh, the white people in this country uh, really giving the black man what he deserves as a, as a full-fledged citizen. Chuck, I can't say I disagree with you. The only thing I'm afraid of is originally the civil rights movement was one in which the black man wanted integration and full acceptance. What I'm afraid of is that the thing has turned around because of the nature of events recently and it's going to end up with the black man being more separated and more alienated from the white man than ever before. Well, you, have, you have to realize this, Stan, that before, when, when a black person, you know, several years ago, when a black person said, I want to be accepted, you know, I want to live in a middle class home, I want to live in your suburb, what the black person was saying then is, I want to be white. The black person stopped saying that now. He's saying that I'm black, I'm not ashamed of being black, in fact, I'm proud of being black. And I'm going to wear Afro prints to school. You remember that's one of the big problems there they've been having in Chicago. And and I'm going to not you know keep my hair sh uh, short. I'm not going to have processes done on my hair. I'm not going to have my wife or my girlfriend or my daughter have her hair straightened so that she can look like a white woman. One can look like black people and be proud of the fact. And everybody should have pride in what he or she is. You know, I think as we have this, this talk and with all the talks I've had with younger people, it should be fairly clear, I think I'm a member of the establishment, I find that at root there isn't that much difference between what the establishment wants and what you young people want. I think want. that's absolutely wrong. The establishment doesn't want to end the war. Uh, you talk about the corporation. Wait a minute, how no. can you possibly make a remark like this? How can I make that remark because the, the war, war has been escalated consistently over the last five years? You can very often get trapped That's why, into a set of peace, circumstances. Because the peace candidates uh, who had the popular following uh, were eliminated from the election. Well, let me ask our other two fellows. Let me by ask bullet in one case and uh, by manipulation of the Democratic Convention. And but the it wasn't other. the establishment that did that. Let me ask Skip, do you Certainly feel honestly... Certainly it was Chicago. Do you, get right back to you, do you feel honestly that the establishment, that the older folks, don't want the war to end? You're saying the establishment is um, well, just one the, body, just one body, you know, everybody in the establishment is going out, or the majority of these people, I mean, I think that the uh, industry that are making money, the people making money out of this war don't want it to end. I think that the people who want to run for any position in this country, that want to placate and please and want to get our votes, will say, no, we don't want this war. These people who want to put an end to the war. I think that we got into this war, so it was a mistake to get into it, and we're trying to get out of it. And that's the excuse of getting but out of it. Why are we trying to get out of it if we don't want the war to end? We do want the war to end. We want the war to end with us. We want to wash our hands with this war, but we don't want the war to end. As long as we can just keep, if we can get our boys out of... Uh, we have a war without our men fighting. Right, but without our money going into it and getting our money back and uh, sending over military aid and I keeping Russia, you know, communist aggression away and like, you know, having American propaganda going over to uh, South Vietnam and getting another protectorate or another, you know, place under the American skirt, you know, behind the American skirt, then fine, that's great. But we got, we couldn't do that, so we had to send over our men to enforce it and now we're trying to get them out. And we don't want to put an end to the war. They say get the men out, put an end to the war. They mean that they put into the war, then they can get the men out. There's no other way of getting our uh, boys out of uh, Vietnam. But if they could get our boys out of Vietnam by saying, well, I'm a new leader, I was just elected two years ago, Mr. Johnson, Mr. McNamara made a mistake, and I have nothing to do with it. I'm clean, so it has no disgrace upon my office or upon me if I say, okay, everybody come home. Right? See, unfortunately, I think it's a little bit of a simplistic view. You just... Well, actually, I shouldn't say you can't. You can end a war by saying everybody come home, but there are too many other things involved. You, It just doesn't work that way. Maybe it should work that Nothing way. Nothing works but, the way it should. But it's unlikely that it ever would, that any um, 
government official, that any chief executive is going to say, I've decided to end the war, everybody come home, because there are so many other things involved. And Absolutely. For instance, markets in the Far East. Now, it's obvious that we would like to win the war and contain China. Now, the problem with that is the Vietnamese people aren't fighting on our side, and so that we have to set up some kind of puppet government in, in Saigon. But the, the problem with the politicians that run the country is, are they going to recognize the legitimacy of the National Liberation Front? And uh, are they going to turn over control to them? See, they're caught in a contradiction because for 15 years we've been uh, brainwashed about the international communist conspiracy. So now it's our devil theory, it's incarnate evil. And now at the same time bringing about peace in Vietnam means turning over the country to those people. And so it's a contradiction the politicians can't deal with. Well, I don't know that anybody who isn't involved right in the higher circles really knows the, the full story. I must admit, I would never defend the war in Vietnam. I think it's an utterly indefensible war. I think it's a ridiculous war. I think I agree with the word you used before. I think it's an obscene war. I might add, I think just about every war is obscene. Uh, certainly anybody who has any defense of war in general is somebody who's speaking a language that I don't understand. But I think you're being equally obscene when you say that the establishment, and whether you say what is the establishment, it isn't everybody or not, we all know who we mean by the establishment. When you say they don't want, the establishment doesn't want the war to end, I think that's just a ridiculous statement. I don't think there's anybody then except what, what concrete people. steps do you see? I mean, isn't it possible, isn't it possible that just as the young people today are floundering and are following different leaders and are first following this particular philosophy, they get the drug scene and the hippie scene, then they suddenly follow the Maharishi, then uh, Herbert Marcuse, and so forth. Wait, the newspapers create those kinds of Well, who knows how they're created, really, but the point is these things happen. Now, isn't it just as possible that the establishment is confused? I don't say that you young people aren't the ones to lead us out of this confusion. Really, the, the main point I'm trying to make is, I think the only way we can be let out, and certainly the young people are the only hope for the world, but only through a legitimate legal manner. I don't think exactly. anarchy is the answer. Just a minute, Stan. When you're talking about the young people and, and how you think the establishment is confused, you're, you're very right. Because when people ask, where did the young people get, you know, where did they get all these ideas? You know where they got them? They got them in Sunday school. They got them watching Roy Rogers on TV. They learned that you don't hurt people, that you don't kill people, you know, that you're nice to people who are weak. And, and yet they see the United States, a big, strong country, killing people in Vietnam, a very small country, a very weak country. And they say that you don't do, uh, that you're not dishonest, you don't steal. And, let, and yet they see corporation executives, you know, like the very epitome of the establishment, uh, carrying on really shady deals because, you know, this is business and that's something different. They see a lot of things going on that really don't jive with what, you know, what the Sunday school teachers and their parents taught them. Because the Sunday school teachers and their parents really don't believe what they taught the kids. And the kids really do believe it. Don't you think that's right, Jeff? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the example that came to my mind is uh, the F-111 scandal. We talked a minute ago about what do we think about Negroes stealing a, a TV set. Well, I, I just uh, was thinking of the F-111, this airplane that's never really worked, and uh, it's been a six billion dollar robbery. Uh, aircraft companies have built the, the taxpayers out of six billion dollars for this worthless piece of junk. Well, I don't think they knew it would be worthless, nor did they want it to be worthless. No, I really don't think the word built is proper in that, in that use, uh, Jeff. I think, I think it absolutely is if you just don't uh, hope for all the time good intentions and say, well, what concretely happened? Well, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a fall. Pollyanna, but I just feel that most people have good intentions. I think, I think the intentions of the people with power is to maintain their power. You see, I think the trouble, again, I agree with what you say, and what you say, you say so much, but I think we're talking different languages. I am afraid that what has happened to the world is we have a good guy, bad guy syndrome. The people who don't agree with us are the bad guys. If you're a liberal, ergo all the conservatives are bad guys. If you're a bad guy, if you're a conservative, all the liberals are bad guys. You discount everything that the other side says. Now, 
you're not in favor of the war in Vietnam, and you're not in a minority. I don't know who can be in favor of the war in Vietnam, except a handful, possibly. But because you're not in favor of that war, anybody who makes airplanes for the war, anybody who's connected with it in any way, isn't just producing an airplane, because that's his business, and he was ordered to by the government, and unfortunately this one didn't work, but he's bilking the public. It's no, too no, simplistic no, there's an attitude. Absolutely not. They're not ordered to. They fight desperately uh, the for, for well, contracts. Right. And then they're ordered to after they And then the secondly, uh, it's the whole process of selling. They try to say, well, if we do a swing wing plane, that's much better than a fixed plane. And this, they get all their fast talking uh, industrial engineers. So you're condemning a mistake. Now, I don't is think probable. it was a mistake. I think that after about the first $2 billion that were wasted, people began to understand that it didn't work. And if you go look through the congressional testimony of two years well, ago, $2 billion dollars have been a bilking also? At what point oh, do you feel it's Okay, let's say they only bilked point? the public out of $4 billion and had a $2 billion dollar mistake. Well, that's, that's, that's really major in my estimation. You see, I think, listening to you fellows, and you, you don't really represent that different a point of view, any of you. I think that the nation is in pretty good hands because, again, and again, maybe I may be being Pollyanna-ish, but I think the three of you want something good. The only thing that is very difficult for the establishment, and I'm speaking now as a representative of the establishment. I don't establishment, think you're part of the establishment. I don't think you have power. That's a good point, then. Let's define terms. To you, the establishment is just the, those in power. That's right. Those people that control the leverage. You mean the, power the political, the, the political leaders, well, and primarily the, the, the uh, universities, leaders, and uh, the, the entrenched bureaucracy within the Pentagon and the government. Well, now what about at the, at the top level? I'm talking about the people at the very top levels of the society, and they're the ones that you feel want the war to continue. And no, there's a, clearly a division among those people. But it seems to me, up until this point, that those people who would want the war ended who find their interests elsewhere are uh, not dominating over those people within the establishment who would uh, like to see it continue because they profit from it. Can I make a, kind of an economic point? In periods of war and economic upheaval, instability, corporations uh, uh, can often grow amazingly by these uh, war contracts. Basic financial institutions, investment houses and banks, uh, generally don't do as well because they work on a long-range perspective and they attempt to uh, give uh, uh, investments and returns to uh, people who would put uh, money into their institutions. Now, uh, the war in Vietnam is not in the interests of most of the New York bankers, for instance, but it is in the interest of the uh, Southwest Air craft companies. It is in the interest of Brown and Root of Houston, uh, which is doing a lot of the construction in uh, uh, Vietnam. And so now what would they be doing in if not for Vietnam? Well, uh, maybe what if were they doing had better Vietnam? goals, uh, they would, uh, the money would be reallocated into welfare projects and uh, taking care of some of the problems in this country. I propose to you that most of these corporations were the war to end would have a brief period of dislocation, of relocation, and would be as solid as ever, and would just then be engaged in commercial ventures of a peaceful nature. What is Boeing aircraft going to build? It's never built anything but planes. Well, there's a great demand for airplanes in this country. The aircraft industry is still in its infancy. We're an expanding economy. We have a whole world ahead of us of air travel, a whole supersonic jet age. I think you know what might have the Boeing? You know what might happen if uh, we stopped going to Vietnam? You find that in the sky would be fighting, you know, in Russia would be patrolled by uh, phantom jets made in America. You know, the standard joke made in Japan. We make we phone would go on, make its planes, just send it over to Israel, like they're sending the uh, phantom they uh, they're talking now about selling it to them. They'd um, send over uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's hold that for a moment and we'll get right back to this point. Welcome again. I'm Stan Lee speaking to Skip Weiss of the Daltonian. Chuck Scoro of the Columbia Spectator, and Jeff Shero, and I can read my writing pretty well, of the Underground Rat, the Underground Newspaper Rat. And um, I'd like to ask about the hippie movement, which I have a feeling is probably dead at the moment or dying. Now, am I right, or does, does anybody think that uh, it's still alive, still has some life in it? 
Okay. Yeah. Now then, if the hippie movement is dead, and if underground newspapers are still doing well, then apparently the two weren't equated in any way. That's right. Um, so you don't have to be a hippie to like the underground newspaper, and you don't have to be a hippie to want change in the nation. This was not just a hippie philosophy, possibly, as many people had thought it was. They didn't want to come out with a holiday clothing, you know, that was normal, like long hair and flowers. And the 200 people or 2,000 people out of the 17 million or 25 million, remember, that live in our country, made news by uh, saying love everybody, which is so, so much different than saying bomb everybody and, you know, make money. So these people came out and made, you know, they made a headline. When you were the Dalton School, now at your school, Skip, you don't have any uh, hippies, and you never did, did you? Oh, yes, we do. Do you really? No, oh, well, we have our, uh... yeah, yeah, we have some hippies. We have some people. Well, isn't that, that... a pretty exclusive private school? Yes, here it's in New York? extremely difficult to have to come in with a jacket and tie and a rose in your hair. But we did it. I mean, there are some people. You know, we have people that march with the uh, National Liberation Front flag, um, and we have a uh, very, we may be a very stupid school. And uh, we have to watch out, you know, so far as our total image. But we are built up of a lot of individual people. Uh, we have extreme, extreme, we have the extreme left, extreme right, and the people just don't know what the hell they're doing. You do have the extreme right also, then? We have, every, we have everything. All shades of opinion at the Dalton School. Because I was going to say, it seems to me, from having spoken to you in the brief time we've been talking, that even though you're going to a, a private school such as the Dalton School, your views really aren't that different from our other two guests. Well, that's my personal view. That's your personal view. I may be the editor of the Daltonian, and the Daltonian may be the Dalton School newspaper, but it sure does not represent everybody's opinion. Well, of course, I have to admit there's a lot in that. It's like uh, if I live in a suburb, and I certainly couldn't speak for all suburbanites. I don't even speak for more than and half. So many people. I mean, I can't certainly ask you, uh, Chuck, what about everybody at Columbia? You can certainly only speak for yourself. But as the editor of the Columbia newspaper. The managing editor. The managing editor. There's an editor-in-chief. Oh, I see. All right. Well, and why isn't he here tonight? Uh, <laughs> as the uh, managing editor of The Spectator, um, would you feel... Well, you must have been right in the thick of things in the student uprising. That's right, we were. And uh, how do you feel it turned out? Do you feel you fellas won? I don't know. I don't know who, who us fellas are. Those feel, who were in the uprising. I feel that a great many good things are beginning to happen. I don't think that that many good things have happened yet. I know that not many good things have happened yet. And I don't think many good things will happen if a lot of pressure isn't kept up. Remember we talked earlier about the black people mm -hmm. and how the, how... What they, they must do is, is, is exert force, perhaps not physical force, they exert sort of even a fear to actually get what they want. And, uh, and part of, uh, part of uh, Jeff's radical philosophy and stuff is that you have to keep up the pressure and you have to keep it going or else we're going to go no, nowhere. Well, if you'll forgive my naivete, could you spell out exactly what it is that's wanted at Columbia? It's sort of, you see, the whole thing about, you know, why the three of us, you find us very similar, is I think all of the young people, at least the young people like us in the United States, are saying, don't say it, do it. The hippies went away and they lived in communes and they loved people and like that. That's what, that's what, you know, the establishment has been saying. They say you should love people, you should, you should help people who are less fortunate than you are. You should be willing to share what you have. The hippies are doing it, and the youth of America, when they when they gripe about the war and they have big demonstrations, are saying, you know, to the people of the establishment, to the older generation, if you will, that you, you all say you're against the war, you all say you're against racism, yet the war is still going on. But there must be more to it than that. Now, I think I love people, and I know I'm against the war in Vietnam, yes. and I know I help anybody whenever I can, but I wasn't revolting at Columbia, and I'm not revolting against anything. Do you see, though, I mean, we, we you get into traps. People get into traps because, like, you edit Marvel comic books, and uh, if your private opinions or your uh, were reflected Marvel comic books, um, you'd, have, you'd be in a hot spot, say. Um, your comics, for instance, uh, build up war and the excitement of, of a battle and that sort of thing. And it's the exact, you say you're against well, no the war. No more so than war. your newspaper does. We oh, present I don't think so. war in some stories. I we don't try to the make Marvel it fun comics, uh, 
uh, really do, you know, kind of exalt it. I don't think There's so. I don't think so. I, I think I really, Marvel if we do, it's unintentional. I think many times I read Marvel where you know, the uh, perennial German Nazi officer, the bad man, will come out and say, what madness is this? He's a man. I'm shooting him. I come across that. You know, it's like, um, it's not just it's not just saying, okay, we will go out and kill and, you know, okay, we have heroes. This man, I'd say Sergeant Fury, uh, you look at him, he may be exalted and his commander may be exalted. But the job they do, and why they do it what is, is not their job. Their job is to stop uh, men that are annihilating 100,000 Jews or 600,000 Jews in Treblinka, mm -hmm. and they're stopping from doing it when they are from spreading that. They're stopping. From, they're stopping men, dictators, stopping the. They're, they're stopping fanatics that are trying to take over the world. For, uh, you know, for sheer uh, power, power mad people. When you say the fanatic is sort of a relative term. A relative to anybody I know. So I mean. Relative to what? Well, I'm sure a lot of people think that uh, members of the New Left are fanatic. A lot of people in the South think that uh, anyone who wants uh, absolute, uh, absolute equality uh, for black people is a fanatic. And the liberals think that the people down South, so many of them, they think of Wallace as a fanatic. You know, I always get a kick out of this use of terms. I've often thought, have you ever noticed when there's a revolution, if the people revolting are the ones whom we consider to be the good guys, we call them freedom fighters. If they're the bad guys, we call them the terrorists. Now, I guess that we're all that way. I guess the people on our side, we can always find a good term for. I've always thought it would be wonderful if we could truly, all of us, be objective. See, I'm afraid. It's unfortunate. I don't know whether it's your youth or what. I don't think you fellas really have the answer because while I think your objectives are right, I think you don't have the objectivity that is required, which I think will probably come later. You have the zeal that's needed, and you're doing a wonderful thing, and you're not wasting your time cheering at a baseball game. You're trying to make a better world. I don't think anybody can condemn that. But I think when you reach the point where you try to make the better world without stepping on other people, which I think very often you do, then I think we'll really be reaching something. See, I think you're dealing with the utopia that doesn't exist. I think one of the things that allows crimes to be perpetuated is the myth of the gentleman. Well, gentlemen uh, and polite people uh, create some of the most heinous acts. No, you people are dealing with a utopia that doesn't exist, because when you talk about going to a commune and living collectively and sharing the wealth and this sort of thing, well, it's patently obvious you can't build a world on this. You can't live collectively. You can't just give things away to everybody. There has to be there has to be a little more organization. It's easy for a select group to do that. It's easy for the four of us to go and live in the hills. But if the whole world says we're giving up our jobs and we're just going to do our thing, then you've got no world, really, and we'll be right back to that? the caveman. Well, Stan, what you're saying, there's a, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. But is it being objective to live in a segregated white suburb? I have a friend who asks his mother periodically when he wants to get a rise out of it. He says, uh, Mom, uh, why aren't there any black people in Beth Page? And it really drives her out of her mind. Because she knows she's really a good person. Well, I like that. But she knows that she's living in this community where there are no black people. She says, well, maybe no black people ever wanted to move to Beth Page. It's, it's the stock answer she gives it. She goes and gets very upset. And as I said a few minutes ago, that it's, what you say is, is important. But, but the youth in the United States aren't, aren't asking uh, whoever's in power to say nice things. They're asking no, them it's to not do a, nice it's things. It's not a case of just saying nice things, I don't think. I think what it is, I think most of us want the same things. I think the younger people feel we want it and we're going to get it and we're going to get it now and we don't care what has to fall by the wayside. Convention, customs, law, because they're all bad anyway and they've gotten us into this mess. The older person, I think the older person for the most part realizes this is not perfection, having ghettos and having poverty, certainly not having war, certainly not having all of the ills that the human race has inflicted on it, but the older person says, I would like to solve this, 
but how can I do it in a workable way? And they, they say this while, while sitting in their living room in their segregated suburb. Well, that's really, I guess, the nat that's human nature. I think the young person always has more drive and the older person is more complacent, but there has been a lot of progress over the centuries. See, what's you happened? So? Oh, yes. You oh, see, yes. what I, I see is a completely different model of what's happening, that the old institutions which hold a society together are disintegrating. And it's not just young people that are upset, but there's a lot of people upset, discontent with how they live. And, uh, I mean, look at one of the basic institutions, like a church. Churches traditionally in society de define the morality. They teach people what's right and wrong. But now in this society, in this period, churches have no real relevance. They, they don't define the ethics. And so I think we're seeing the con collapse of old outdated institutions that grew up uh, out of our old traditions and the beginning formation of new institutions because we're a new kind of urban society. Again, and Jeff, I can't, I can't really disagree with you, but I think the reason is not because the young people have opened our eyes so much as the fact that due to the change that has come along, due to the increased communications, the expanded communications, I think that the whole world has become more sophisticated and it's happened very quickly. I don't think you could sell a generation on a war now using the slogan, the war to end all wars, because I think people would know today there's no such thing. And when this war is over, there's going to be trouble again, unless we find a real workable way of stopping it. I think the human race, because of television, I think McLuhan has a lot in what he says. The medium has become so important. It's freed people all over. It's opened their minds. It's expanded their horizons. And what's happened is people are thinking now. People can see the paradoxes which you speak of, and there are many more in the world. There are many. We say one thing, we do another. We want one thing, we settle for something else. Suddenly, these things have become patently obvious because of the nature of the 20th century because of travel and transportation which have brought us closer together because of tv why when i was young i would go to a movie perhaps once a month and this was my contact with anything other than the bosom of my family you see i might listen to the radio once in a while why today any youngster uh, i accept the, the the poorest imaginable has a television set and he sees things by the age of seven or eight that I didn't know about or certainly had never seen until I was an adult. It's a different world. This is why I guess that the young people are becoming more aggressive. Maybe they're more aware. The only point really that I would like to make is I don't see where it benefits us. If in trying to get new institutions that are better, we tear down the foundations for them. You, I don't think well, you can build a society of better laws by tearing down the other laws. That's the only way another society is built, is by tearing down the old and building up the new. You must work on the foundations of what is established, and if the only way of making those foundations is to tear down the establishment. I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating go out and you know, kill up all the uh, government officials and uh, let's start all over again. Let's put in uh, who we want, let's put a hippie in. And in the war, let's put us, you know, anything, whoever we want. Uh, you're, you're, you are talking more idealistically than I, I think that you may think that we're talking, well, preferably. The trouble is, you fellas aren't idealistic enough. No, you're saying, okay, wait, go through the legislature, proper channels, and go ahead and get your laws put through, get, you, uh, get your boys out of Vietnam peaceably. Don't step on anybody's uh, toes, don't break any windows, don't riot. Now, I can't see how. But don't you see? My feeling is I'm afraid. I'm afraid every action has a reaction. My sympathies really are with the liberals. But the minute the liberals get too much power, the minute the liberals get out of line and become too much of a threat, the nation will swing toward conservatism. And the very things I think you're trying to accomplish are apt to be crushed. There are a couple of things. Uh, liberal is sort of a dirty word in the radical movement. Uh, to call someone a liberal, if you happen to be a member of SDS, is, is like really calling him a nasty thing. A liberal is a person who went to Chicago and cast his ballot for Hubert Humphrey. A liberal is a person who saw kids in the streets really getting beaten savagely. And he's the person who said, uh, well, they were here marching around and they had beards and stuff. They deserved it. That's what a liberal is. Well, there again, now we have to start redefining terms.
I thought, uh, of a liberal, obviously, in a different way. In other words, now the thing is to be a radical. To be a liberal is almost to be a conservative, by, by your definition. Well, it's the same thing now. It's become the same thing in our country. Those, those people, it's, let me take a step back. You know, four years ago, SDS was organizing in the poor white ghettos, and SNCC, which is, we all know where Stokely Carmichael went with black power and everything, SNCC was organizing a poor blacks in Mississippi and in the South, and there was this idea of the interracial movement of the poor, and would win justice. And after battering our heads against a wall and seeing no real progress, uh, we learned this one lesson, and that is measure changes in the society by your own life. That means that for the Negro in Mississippi, the politician would come through and say, look, we passed this wonderful civil rights bill. But the Negro was taught to ask, well, how did that change my own life? Jeff, and I it wanna, really didn't. I want to comment on that, and let's come back to that in just one moment after this break. <laughs> Which is not really what I want to talk about. I don't know if you do, but it was suggested. Let's talk about it. Let's go. Well, gentlemen, we just have a few minutes left, and one more point that people usually have uh, more than a passing interest in is the subject of sex. Now, what about the new morality in this country? Um, even though hippiedom is dead, I'm sure that the certain uh, different change in morals is still alive. How do you feel, for example, about free love? I, I assume I, I can anticipate your answer, but I'd like to hear it. What do you mean by free love? Well, about the fact that... Um, uh, sex is uh, just sort of for everybody to enjoy, and why make such a big deal about it? Everybody's always thought that way. It's the church. Mm -hmm. It's some people. People always wanted to enjoy sex. It was just a book. But now that we have the hippie movement, now we're going to say we're actually saying what we you know we've been saying it, but we've been talking, but it was you know not supposed to be said. So that's it. You feel then that the taboos have been lifted? Then, yeah, you know, we make such a big thing. People make such a big thing about free love and all that uh, it's getting a more liberal you know, life. Was well, this a universal opinion? Well, I think one of the things we have to remember, Stan, is that most of, of the young people, at least the young people that I know, are much less interest, interested in institutions than they are about what these institutions produce. They're more, much more interested in love and really loving someone, really giving yourself to someone. They are, and they are, in all kinds of, uh, of community morality and, and what they consider to be sort of false codes of morality that are that are, that are sort of superimposed on them. I don't think, I don't think that, that it's any really horrible thing that people are, are much more interested in personal relationships and in love than they are in institutions. Well, then you feel that there is a definite change in the morals today, and even though, as we said, hippiedom as such is waning, many of its after effects are lingering on. Well, I think you can see two things that, uh, People are much more oriented towards having real depth in a relationship. In the old days, people would get married and stay married to this person for 30, 40 years out of duty. They might hate it and they but might never like more, to sleep isn't with Isn't there more depth to sex being somewhat meaningful and being less casual? If something is casual, can it have as much depth? I mean, if a fellow goes Maybe from one girl to by another. Practice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think what we're talking about is, is that something being casual. I think, I think what, what Jeff and I are talking about is something really being meaningful. I'm not sure you and Jeff are talking about the same thing. I don't thing. think we necessarily are, but, but I think that we both, both agree that what people are looking for is honesty and something that is, that is really meaningful. See, I think that in the urban uh, areas, people make love quite casually. But in a kind of cold society where people are cut off from each other, then uh, making love is a way of touching, a way of getting through the barriers to people. It kind of, it, you uh, go into the bedroom and get into the bed, and I mean, then, then you've kind of stripped of a lot of the phoniness. And it becomes, as uh, you just mentioned, Skip, a new mode of communication then. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for a very enlightening and I hope interesting discussion, and I hope we'll meet again real soon. Okay. Thanks, Stan.